They bomb their countries and kill their women and children. And I kind of double took and I went, did he just say that out loud? I, I didn't think politicians were allowed to talk about that kind of stuff. And then that kind of opened my eyes and made me become an activist. Now, I'm obviously not a Ron Paul libertarian anymore, but um, V Radio is essentially just my broadcast that I do as an independent journalist. You can check it out at v-radio.org. I'll write that down up there eventually. But um, eventually, I watched Zeitgeist Addendum, and uh, the idea of the resource-based economy came to my head, and then I suddenly I went through this epiphany and rethought and reevaluated the way I think about the world in general and the solutions that I had been looking for my whole life. So I'm going to try to coalesce in a way that's less um, clinical than I think some people have presented this and try to bring it to you in a way that's easy to understand. You know. Um, so first of all, let's go over what everybody needs if you're a living organism on Earth. All right, one thing everybody on Earth has in common, food, water, shelter, and energy, okay? Shelter can be a hut, or it could be something far more advanced than that, but if you don't have all of these things, you're going to die. Now, one thing that has severely changed about mankind is that there was a time when we can pretty much get most of these things together ourselves, you know? Maybe in a tribe or whatever, we'll get together, we'll gather things, we'll have a small community, we'll kind of get together and make sure that we have everything we need, you know, the world was in a state where you could do that. Like, uh, have you ever watched Little House on the Prairie? He had to go to the general store, meaning Mr. Ingalls, like maybe once a month, you know, because his wife made their clothes, they had a farm, they had everything they needed, really, but every now and then they'd go and they'd get some tools or something like that. Okay, now we live in a society where everybody lives out of the store. Every, you know, it's like, well, yeah, I know where chicken comes from. It comes from the supermarket. You know, They have no idea how to actually get their own food. They have no idea how to build their own shelter. They have no idea how to get their own water. Water comes out of a faucet. Okay. Now, to us, we're thinking we're living high in the hog and that that's, that's this really advanced state of being. The problem is, is that it's all plugged into money. And money is only moved if it's profitable. Well, unfortunately, as we're finding out, being the whole 99% versus 1% paradigm, it's not always profitable to be sure that everybody has food, that everybody has water, and everybody has shelter, and everybody has energy. In fact, in most cases, it's actually more profitable to be sure that it's hard to get these things because then you can charge more money. Okay, so let's break this down. We have been kind of in condition as a society to believe that we need to have a job. In fact, if you don't have a job, you're a loser. There's something wrong with you. The funny thing that I encounter, actually myself, because I'm self-employed, is that in the system, even if you're just self-employed and you're doing okay, they still look at you like there's something wrong with you because you're, you don't have a job. The system is designed to essentially enslave you to get any of these things. You have to find a way to be more useful to somebody who has more money than you, than their money. Now, with a profit motive in a capitalist situation, it's actually to their benefit to find a way to make it so they don't need you. So that's why they have efficiency experts who sit around all day trying to figure out how to eliminate your jobs. And that's a trend that's only going to continue. Any politician that tells you they're going to bring you jobs, you're going to have to ask them how. Well, what are you going to do? Are you going to make it illegal to outsource? Are you going to make it illegal to automate? Let's talk about that. Let's break that down a little more. All right, so I had a friend who used to make her living working at a video store. You ever notice video stores are becoming a thing of the past? Well, they're getting replaced by things like Netflix. They're getting replaced by, well, illegal downloading. And they're getting replaced by little automated machines called Redbox. It's a vending machine where you get your video, okay? Well, video stores are closing down. So she eventually lost her job. She had to move out of my house because she couldn't pay rent anymore, okay? That's a very small element of this. But this sort of thing is happening to all jobs. Because once again, if you can automate something, it doesn't, if it's a machine, it doesn't need a vacation, it doesn't need healthcare, it might need maintenance, 
But it doesn't care if you work it 24 hours a day. It doesn't have a labor union. Okay? And the only thing that can compete with automation right now is sweatshop labor, slavery. I mean, they, they tell the people that they're working, and they even maybe treat them like it, maybe a little. But a lot of sweatshop laborers don't really live much better than slaves did in the South. Okay? So given that, the system is finding ways to try to not need us. And that means that we have to have our own solutions. And if we think it's going to be because we elected somebody who's supposed to fix it, the system's not designed to be fixed. The system is designed to create profit for the top. It's not designed to be fixed. In fact, it never was. To take you a little bit of a history lesson, um, comes from my friend Senator Mike Gravel. Because uh, I started working from him after Ron Paul. And when I was on the Ron Paul thing, I was all about the founding fathers. <laughs> He taught me a lot about the Founding Fathers, and one of the first things he taught me was, well, the Founding Fathers were just a bunch of, another big group of aristocrats. They all had money, most of them. You know, even the one that I say that I like the most, Thomas Jefferson, owned the most slaves, okay? And that's the guy that I can quote the most often, but in, in retrospect, the reality is they were another group of people who had money, who wanted to secure that money. If you remember in the beginning, Colonies used to get together and have town hall meetings, not really that different from general assemblies. People would get together and they'd talk and they'd share their ideas and they'd decide, well, I don't know if we should do this, or maybe I do think. And then, if you know what, if you didn't agree with it, that was okay. You could stay out of it. You see a little bit of it in the movie The Patriot. Now, here's the problem. There were people in the northern states who did not want there to be slavery. There were people in the southern states who did want there to be slavery. You couldn't get these groups to agree and therefore ratify a constitution if the people were actually being consulted. So they developed a different system, a delegate system. They convinced everyone, well, you just choose someone else to make your decisions for you, and then they'll go to the convention and they'll make the decisions. Okay, well, here's the problem. Because of that, we got a constitution with slavery in it because they sent representatives. Well, who do those representatives end up being? Well, they end up being the people who have the money to go and campaign. Can a blacksmith campaign? No, he can't leave his smithy. Can a farmer campaign? No, they can't leave their farm. This hasn't really changed. In fact, it's gotten worse. The American dream is a plutocracy pretending to be a representative democracy. It was never actually a symbol of freedom. It was a way to keep, that's why you see all that stuff in the Founding Fathers about democracy is, you know, two, you know, two wolves and a sheep deciding what's for dinner because they didn't want a 99% to mobilize, okay? Now that little history lesson out of the way, the system was designed and facilitated to you have money at its core at what moves everything from the beginning, okay? There was never a system in question that was really supposed to be for the common man. It never existed, okay? It was just another way to create new nobles. And who are those nobles now? Well, we call them people like Ted Turner, you know, the, the big one percenters, okay? To us, it's always been about labor. How do we find a job? And because of that, as the system decays, because it's falling apart, because there's one other aspect of the system that is not really going to stand up much longer, because mankind's technology is growing at an exponential rate. And what is that? Let's look at it for a second. We got producers. These are people who make products. Okay. People who buy them, who are also usually the people who are working. <laughs> I'm not using the same terms Peter Joseph did, but it's called cyclical consumption. This is how it works. You work to make products. The guy on top, the one percenter, is getting all the money for those products. And in theory, you're supposed to spend your wages buying those products, okay? When the worker gets pulled out of that, what you have is what we have here in Michigan, which is that, for example, we automate the auto industry largely, or we outsource it to countries where people are willing to work for slave labor wages, okay? Well, what happens because of that is everybody is out of a job. Nobody has any money to buy the products. This is a downward spiral that eventually ends with nothing. Nobody has anything, okay? That's where we're heading towards now. You can almost see it right now in Michigan because what ends up happening is the service sector, that is what's left, and you get all these GM workers and stuff that are out of work, well, they have to go find a job selling stuff. 
Well, the only problem is, is that nobody's hiring because nobody's buying anything. So in the end, the house of cards falls and the people at the top, well, they've still got their money, so they don't really care what happens to us. So the Venus Project, which is what most of the Zeitgeist Movement is kind of founded on, about a guy named Jacques Fresco. He's now 96 years old. He grew up during the Great Depression. And he saw a world that's not very different than the one we're in now. In fact, in some cases worse, in some cases now it's a little better. But he was looking at homeless people next to empty houses. Does that sound familiar? He was looking at unemployed people next to factories that have been closed down. He was looking at starving people next to food that could be given to them. And he realized, what's wrong with this system? And so he started to think about it logically and rationally. And that's not something that we really do. We hire politicians. But what does a politician do? A politician is entirely at the mercy of the money system. So he's going to do whatever's going to get him elected. When that was really about us voting, that was different. But now we're in a situation where it's about who can give the biggest campaign donations. Well, who gives the biggest campaign donations? The 1%. So what do we get? We get people who represent the 1%. Because the average voter is not educated enough to recognize. And I, I did a whole show about that that you guys can listen to. It's called On the Subject of Sheeple. On the Subject of Sheeple, I played two recordings, one of which was about people talking about Sarah Palin, and the other one was about people just talking about candidates in general. And they said to them, would you like Sarah Palin to be president? And they said, oh yeah, absolutely. I'd love Sarah Palin to be president. You know why they would like that? Is because the media spent a lot of money pushing Sarah Palin's image. But then you ask them questions like, what do you think of her domestic policy? And they just kind of go, uh, well, I can't think of any right now. You know, well, what do you think of her foreign policy? Well, I'm sure she had to have dealt with border issues from being the governor of Alaska, which is next to Russia. You know, it's, and these are supposedly fully educated adult human beings, okay? How does it get like that? Well, <laughs> one more piece of history we'll be talking about is how we got to where we're at is that it's a term called social engineering. They went to a man named Edward Bernays. Edward Bernays was Sigmund Freud's nephew. And they asked him, how do we arrange the culture to make people believe that their consumption of goods is their freedom? How do we do that? And well, so they talked to the sociologist, and they managed to see, he's like, well, what you need to do is, you know, put together these imageries and kind of set up the culture in this way. And when you were finished, you have people who are like, I am a successful person, I am a good person, and I am a valued person because I have 2.5 kids and a gas guzzler car and a white picket fence, and if I don't have these things, or if I am someone who doesn't have these things, I am clearly not a good person. I am a failure as a person. Okay? There are hundreds more different things you can look into in this, and that's why I'm going to suggest that if you want to, go to my website, and I have a huge list of documentaries you can watch about this stuff. But it also starts at the very root of our childhood. Okay, we, we spend a lot of time on this, actually. There's another documentary called Consuming Kids, where they expose that they're literally putting, I'm not making this up, devices on kids' heads to watch their brain reactions to specific colors, to sounds, you know, to whatever it is that's being used to try to figure out, well, what causes children to have the joyful reaction? And then when they're finished, you have children who want specific brands, and then they start nagging their parents. And I've seen this reaction because I don't let my children watch commercials. From five minutes of my friend not knowing that and turning on a channel on the TV that had commercials on it, my children went immediately into my room and started yelling at me about specific brand name products. Within that, just that quick. Just because it's, it's geared that way. Okay? So, basically, we have a lot of problems. You guys all know that, or you wouldn't be here. The solutions that I suggest are, first of all, mankind has already got the technology necessary to give everybody the energy they need, to give everybody the food they need, and to give everybody the shelter they need. Okay? That all exists. It's never been all put together in the same line. Just like Jason said earlier about solar, there's an active 
intention to deprive us of the knowledge about the true potentials of this technology. That's why you don't even know what geothermal is. I was talking to one guy, he was like, geothermal, that's Star Trek, that's not real. And I was like, do you know that Iceland is 70% powered by geothermal? To those of you who don't know what it is, it's steam coming up out of the earth. You set up a little pinwheel on it and you get energy. It's free, it's clean. Most people don't even know it exists. Why not? Because the monetary system is only interested in self-perpetuating itself. In ancient Rome, it was bread and circuses. And today, they keep us asleep with American Idol and you know any number of other things that don't really have a lot of value. And they've managed to engineer our society that talking about the things we're talking about right now becomes offensive. Like, you're not allowed to discuss politics, you're not allowed to discuss religion, don't discuss anything actually that makes you think. You can just talk about as much BS as you want to. You know, we as a people, as a species, have allowed ourselves to be engineered in this way, and it's preventing us from seeing the very real solutions that are right there. So let me ask you, do you need a job working for someone else to pay for your food, or do you need, do you have the ability to produce your own food? Even if you have to come together as a community, do you need a job, or do you need to be able to produce your own food? Do you need a job to pay your water bill, or do you need to learn how to purify and use your own rainwater? Do you need a job to be able to make your own shelter, or do you need to learn how to build your own shelter? Do you need to do some of the efforts like Occupy Detroit is doing right now about getting some of these houses that are just sitting there and actually making them livable again? Do you need a job to get energy? Well, as you heard from Jason from Occupy Flint, solar is one option. But when you look at the real global implications, it's actually probably going to be geothermal and solar and tidal and, you know, and water. There's, you, if you get them all together, we shouldn't even need to be paying an electric bill. Do you need a job to pay an electric bill or do you need electricity? We have to get out of the mindset that they've kept this in, which is that our entire purpose is to find a job. We, as, especially in these communities, like when I was out at Occupy Detroit, when I was at Grand Circus Park camping with everybody, it looks like a war zone, and there's a whole bunch of unemployed workers who could be coming together as a community to work on projects like the ones Jason is with the solar panels. You could come together as a community and build community gardens and produce your own food to feed the people that are hungry in your city. You could come together as a community and look for real solutions. The solution is not always going to be Go find yourself a politician, and hopefully they'll change things for you. Because unless it's in their best interest, it isn't going to happen. That's, that's a hard fact. But the reality of the matter is this. Okay, Let's look, let's look at two different ways to approach it. Resource-based economy way. We want to build a bridge. Okay, that, as opposed to a capitalist way. You go to a city council, you say you want the bridge. The city council members there decide, well... Which one of my campaign providers is going to be the best to give this contract to? I'm going to give them a no-bid contract, of course, which means that I'm going to give them the most amount of money I can. And why do I care? Because it's the taxpayer's money anyway, and I'm going to get a big political contribution if I do it that way. Okay? Or you can go find an architect who actually knows what he's doing, get together as a community, and then make sure that the bridge is built right the first time. So that's another issue. You privatize it. They want to come back and fix it. So... Of course, it's not in their best interest to build it to work right away. Okay, build it right the first time, intelligently, with the purpose of actually benefiting the people using it and not benefiting the pocketbooks of the people on top. Okay, rational scientific explanations for things is not generally how we do stuff. We have a tendency to elect popular people who do not necessarily have our best interests in mind, supposedly to solve our problems instead of actually using basic rational logic and science to solve our problems. And that is the crux of it. I could go into much more detail, but I think you guys have gotten a lot of that tonight. What it really amounts to is whether or not the methods to get there, like maybe solar's not the way, maybe title's not the way, but when there's a problem presented to society, then we rationally, through the scientific method, analyze that problem and then come up with proposed solutions, test those solutions, and whichever one proves to be the best, well, that's the one we pick. It's not the Republican choice, it's not the Democrat choice, it's not the Green choice or the Libertarian choice, it's which one of those bridges, bridge designs that we put together actually will last longer? Rational thinking. Not, well, I'll elect some guy who hopefully will build me a bridge. Okay? 
At the very core of everything that we do as a, man, as a species, we've allowed ourselves to basically kind of be robbed of our brains. All right? We've allowed ourselves to lose our focus on everything that actually belongs to us. And we essentially, you know, you can do a lot of studies about the way that works by looking further in that stuff I told you about with Edward Bernays earlier, but we have stopped taking you know, responsibility. It kind of reminds me of that part of V for Vendetta when he's saying, you know, I'm sure that you would like to talk about who's at fault, you know. And of course there are some people who are more at fault than others, but if you're really looking who's at, whose fault it is, you have to look in the mirror. Every one of us who allows the wool to be pulled over our eyes and allows the media to control our thinking and does nothing about it is equally at fault. So now that everything's falling apart, like you see here in this city, like you see in many other cities across America, more people are starting to wake up. More people are starting to come out of their homes and actually be part of a community. And that's where it's going to start. It's going to start in a grassroots level when people decide, you know what, you keep playing your game over there. We've already built a power plant. We don't need your help. We don't need your welfare because we've already built a local farm. You weren't giving it to the people who really needed it anyway. We don't need your shelter because we've already got that handled too. Don't try to change the system. And although I'm not going to say, you know, give up on that, just rebuild it for yourselves. That's where we're at. Trying to fix this thing that was designed from the beginning to keep the people who with the most money on top, it, it's, it's like trying to fix a car that has no battery in it. <laughs> no matter how much you do to the rest of it, it it's never going to run, because it wasn't meant to. So think for a moment about redesigning your culture, redesigning it with everything in mind. I'll give you one more design example of how we don't tend to think very much about what we do. The people mover had to kind of be forced into Detroit's infrastructure. Imagine that we design cities that have people movers everywhere. From the beginning, it was always in there. We didn't have to add it later, it was always in there. Well, if we had a people mover everywhere, then not everybody would need a car. If not everybody needs a car, then there's so much less resources being used, so much less pollution, etc., etc., etc. Okay? It's a very simple, basic concept. Then eventually, once you start to get this in your head, this concept of let's honestly, rationally, logically look at every problem, scientifically evaluate it via data, not our egos or our rah-rah speeches, but actually looking at it in the real, and then finding solutions, that's actually where you're going to make life better. And every time I've ever seen it happen, especially when you get money out of the situation, like when you go to Occupy Flint, for example, They've got their solar power, everything's taken care of. People feel much more free. Okay, you ever watch the movie Garbage Warrior? The guy specializes in off-the-grid living, and that's basically what we're talking about, off-the-grid living on a mass scale. And the one day he finally finished his house that was largely made out of reused junk, he said, wait a minute, I, I don't have a job, and I don't need one. Hell, I'm gonna go for a walk. And he just went for a walk. He's like, that was the most amazing thing I've ever done. I, I don't answer to anybody. I don't have a boss. I, you know, I don't have you know, uh, any bills because everything's all taken care of. This is amazing. You know? And when we were in camp in Detroit, it felt the most free that I've ever felt. I mean, although we, we deal still had to gather resources from other sources, but still, that life was life. What we normally have now is a rat race and I don't feel alive when I'm clicking a clock and working for 40 hours to make someone else rich. I would feel alive if I was working in my own garden. I would feel alive if I was helping people build a solar power plant for my community. That would make me feel alive. And more to the point now, folks, whether or not you think this is a good solution, it doesn't matter because the earth is not going to put up with us infinitely making garbage. There's only so much here. Eventually, we're going to run out. So we can either keep doing what we're doing and eventually, well, die, or we can intelligently look at what we have and build an infrastructure around that. And even if the methods and the suggestions we've given earlier are not what ends up being there, it's the methodology, it's the way you approach life, the rational thinking, the rational approach to finding a solution to every problem that we have using the scientific method. Because also, the scientific method doesn't mind being proven wrong. If you, if you find something else that's a better solution, then you just change it. You don't get caught up in, well, damn, uh, if I admit I was wrong about that, I'm definitely going to lose the next election. Uh...
So then we just stifle. Mankind gets stuck in, you know, ego and all that, when we really should just be looking at things rationally and coming up with real solutions. So, thank you very much.